Welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and with video here on YouTube. Uh, okay, so this week, Aftermath, the finale show aired, as I'm sure almost anybody who watches my channel knows. And it was quite a spectacular two hours. Yes, there was a ton of stuff that was not said. Yes, there was a ton of stuff still to say. But that two hours was absolutely amazing as far as I was concerned. And I now get to, of course, share with you since I was on the show, you now know I was there. I couldn't talk about it up until now. We are very, very excited about the fact that it is now out there. And I was even more excited, of course, to be on the show because I was sure, I was absolutely positive that I was going to get cut. I mean, no question about it. I was standing there. I thought people could probably hear my stomach flippy flopping as I was talking, I'm surprised the mic didn't pick it up because I was like, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I was so nervous. And, uh, but I made the point I wanted to make. And I thought that it was uh, very interesting that of all the commercial breaks where the church had responses or denials for whatever was said in the last segment, there was no such denial stated after my clip. And I don't know honestly what to make of that, but I just thought it was an interesting observation. So, uh, on the heels of the feast of the season finale, uh, we are very privileged to have one of the actual guests on the show, uh, who was a non-Scientologist, and this is somebody who has also graced our shores before. Uh, she has been on this podcast in the past, and that is Dr. Natalie Feinblatt. Now, do I have that? Yep. You got it right. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, good. Yep. I butcher everybody's names. <laughs> no, you did well. Excellent. Thank you. And you, how would you describe yourself as a professional? I am a licensed clinical psychologist here in Los Angeles, California. Um, at this point, I am like 75% in private practice, 25% just doing a little bit of contracting work. Um, my big specialties are addiction and trauma, but as you know, from having me on this podcast before and then being on, um, the aftermath, you know, my, one of my little niche areas is, uh, recovery, uh, help for former cult members. Um, so that's not, it's on my website. I have a page for it on my website. Um, but you know, luckily enough, this is a small group of people that you can't really like build a whole practice on that. So I have my, my big specialties of addiction and trauma, and then my kind of little, you know, subset of trauma, which is kind of how I look at it for helping former cult members. Awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, it didn't occur to me until just now when you were laying out those differences and similarities there that I think as uh, with the things I've been spending my time researching and learning about with, with neurology and, and brain work and, and how that relates to psychological conditions that we're going to see, I think, as time moves on and therapies get developed, I think we're going to see a, a more of a merging of mm -hmm. these what are now considered separate categories of, yeah. of, of trauma or experience. Mm -hmm. And of and of course, I wanted to have you on because I want to dive right into this. I don't, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't really talk before, put some kind of outline mm -hmm. together. I've just got a few questions I want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. um, but this is going to talk about, we're going to talk about cult recovery. Yeah. And um, and really, this has to do with uh, the, the same, I think, uh, if you were going to, if you if you took the cult word out of it, maybe, and you, mm -hmm. and you sort of thought about the nature of the trauma. We're talking about betrayal. We're talking about loss. We're talking about threats of loss. We're talking about abuse of physical, often physical nature, uh, almost 100% emotional nature of some yeah. kind, right? Some kind of like yeah. what we would understand as mental or psychological stresses mm -hmm. and, and pressures being put on people. Um, how would you, how else would you describe what it is you're dealing with when you are treating somebody who has come out of a destructive cult or high control or authoritarian group situation? Well, I mean, yeah, the, the number one thing that if you were involved with a group like this, whether you were joining as an adult or you were a second generation member, somebody who was born or, you know, your parents joined when you were a kid, um, bar none, there is psychological abuse and manipulation. Like that's, that's the very least that happened to you. 
um, that that's the baseline for anybody who's been in a situation like this. The, the abuse and manipulation could take different forms. Um, but it's, I mean, that's part and parcel of being in an abusive group like this. Um, and then depending on the individual's experience, there could be other layers of trauma, whether it's physical or sexual or, or things of that nature. But at the very least, you know, and some people who come to me for help in this area are already aware of that. You know, they've been able to identify what they've been through as abuse, manipulation, coercion, however many different ways you want to say that. But some people even, they have maybe some understanding of that, but it's really like helping them even come to an understanding of like, oh no, you, you know, you did some stuff that you really regret, but it's not all you. Like you were, you were being abused and manipulated and coerced into doing these things. Um, so that's, that's the very least that's going on. Excellent. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, you, you know, uh, just following on what you just reported there that of course you have to do some education or there might be it might become yeah. necessary to do a little bit of education or whatever mm -hmm. how would you define for a general audience what constitutes traumatic episodes versus mm -hmm. say the knocks of regular life that we all should be sort of used to or be able to deal with in a in a somewhat healthy way you know, to, to varying degrees, I know, individual to individual, but how do you differentiate those two things for, for the lay person? Sure. So it used to be the case. Um, I was trained, so in the field of psychology and psychiatry and just mental health, um, the, the main things that we use to like diagnose people with things are either the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Illness, or more and more, we're also moving toward the ICD, which is the, oh boy, I'm going to blank on that, but it's the <laughs> <laughs> international something of diseases um, where it's, it's not just psychology. It's like, you know, codes for every possible mental or physical problem you could have. But mostly for psych psych uh, psychologists, we are trained using the DSM and there's been different uh, versions of the DSM over time. Um, we're currently on version five. However, that only came out several years ago. I was trained in the version four. And in version four, the definition of trauma was pretty um, limited. It was like, you know, trauma was pretty much either you experiencing a situation where you thought you were going to die or you were threatened to die um, or you witnessing someone die or witnessing someone's life being threatened. That was pretty much the, the standard definition of trauma was like, it, it involved had like, to have a life threatening aspect in it. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, however, in the DSM five, and I'm happy about this as a trauma specialist, they have broadened the definition. Um, it no longer has to be life threatening essentially. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. It, it includes the life threatening stuff. Absolutely. But it's also, you know, any sort of extreme out of the norm situations that you wouldn't be expected to run into in a, in a fairly, you know, balanced, healthy life. So the reason that this is good is because now that also covers psychological abuse, um, as well as not just like, you know, a physical or sexual assault where your life was being threatened, but maybe also one where like, okay, you didn't think you were going to die, but you still got assaulted, you know? Um, so it, it's a much broader definition. So the way that I explain it to people regarding the question that you've asked, um, you know, di differentiating between like, oh, just the hard knocks of life and trauma is like trauma dysregulates our brain and our nervous system. So typically, if you've been through the hard knocks of life, you're not thinking about those things constantly and you're not finding yourself being physiologically reactive to reminders of those things, right? Whereas if you've been through trauma, you've been through something that is on the more extreme end of human experience, you, you can't stop thinking about it. You get really triggered very easily. You get stuck in your thoughts and you find, you know, for some people it's panic attacks, for some people it's other things, but you know, you have physiological reactivity around what happened to you. 
That's a very interesting way of expressing that because it makes it, correct me if I'm wrong, relative. Mm -hmm. One person's trauma is not necessarily another person's trauma. Does this get in the way of uh, friends, relatives, family understanding Mm -hmm. how somebody could be in a traumatic situation because from their point of view, Mm -hmm. what's the big deal? Does that come across your plate very often? Um, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and yes, it is relative. You know, I've run into people, um, both in relation to, to former cult members and not, who are like, you know, I had this kind of extreme thing happen to me, but I'm able to just kind of, you know, like it's not really affecting me anymore. And I tell people like, I'm not in the business of trying to convince you that you've been traumatized and you need psychological help. If you really feel like what happened to you was, you know, a big deal, but that you've moved past it and it's not really an issue for you anymore. Great. I'm happy for you. (laughs) Like (laughs) That's wonderful. Um, You know, I am in the business of helping people who come to me saying, I can't stop thinking about this. I can't stop, you know, having feelings about this. Um, But yes, I do run into that whole, like, why can't you just get over this? I went through something like that. I'm okay. Why aren't you okay? And I, I hope, and I, I see us moving in this direction. It's slow, but it's there. I hope that people are getting a better understanding of like, just because something happened to you and it, it maybe wasn't a big deal to you, or if it was, you've been able to move past it, doesn't mean that it it's not going to have a lasting impact on somebody else who's bringing their own unique mental and physical makeup to that situation. Exactly. I I definitely agree with that. Um, I'm curious how much, um, you know, people will get started on a course of therapy. We talk about in the X community, Mm -hmm. X Scientology, certainly, uh, and this has been something I've explained to people in other communities, and they've glommed onto the idea or had their own already, of uh, of the onion layers, right? Yeah. Onion mm-hmm. layers coming off, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, of, uh, and it's an analogy. It's not like your brain is literally stripping off layers, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. of, of trauma or something. It's a, it's a, it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely a symbolic analogy, but it's mm-hmm. but it's a pretty good one because mm-hmm. I've found six years out, seven years out, that I still have mm-hmm. things come up, and uh, and I you know sometimes they can really take you by surprise. Yeah. Uh, everything's fine. Life is good. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then suddenly, boom, you know, you're suddenly in this depressive funk and you don't really understand why. And for me, I had to, you know, I'm, a, I'm probably way more introspective than I should be. <laughs> I, uh, you know, but I do a lot of thinking about thinking and you know, just the nature mm-hmm. of what I do. And so there it was, another layer of the onion presenting itself as to, mm-hmm. you know, what was some of that depression and stuff. So I guess I'm wondering how long and how deep do you have to go as a, and how do you assess as a counselor, as a therapist with this, how, you know, what, how many onion layers are there? Is there any way to even figure that out at the beginning or does it take some work first, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I stood up was because I realized I had a little booklet over here. Um, Because I specialize in addiction, I'm very familiar with all the different support groups that are out there. Um, including all of the anonymous groups. And it's funny, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but there's actually a a booklet called Peeling the Onion (laughs) from Codependence Anonymous. Perfect. Um, Yeah, because they're they're big on that concept in there. And it really applies to so much, including cult recovery. Um, You know, I think that it, it has to be assumed when I, I mean, I certainly assume it when I first start seeing somebody who's wanting to process what they went through in a, in an abusive group, that there are multiple layers to the onion. Um, you know, for some people, it's a bigger onion. For some people, it's a smaller onion. You know, you don't really get a sense of that until you've been working with them for a little while. Um, but I've, I mean, I've noticed that while cult recovery is certainly unique in a lot of respects, one thing it has in common with recovery from addiction or mental health issues or other types of trauma is that almost certainly there will be things that I or maybe people in a support group 
share with somebody at the beginning of their recovery that they'll just kind of like hear it and it'll just kind of go in one ear and out the other. And then like a couple years later, they'll hear the exact same thing, but all of a sudden it will resonate and it will be like, oh my gosh, hold on a second. <laughs> you know, like, holy moly, I never made that connection before. Um, so I, I see that happen all the time, all the time. And, you know, I'm probably thinking about this um, and I'm going to bring it up because it's, it's kind of in the forefront of my mind right now. You know, as a, a trauma therapist, I am trained in EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a specific type of trauma therapy. And then recently about three, and you know what, Chris, it didn't even occur to me until I was not there anymore. You're in Colorado, right? Correct. I am in Colorado. Yes. Okay. So I was in Colorado. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It didn't occur to me until I was literally on the way home. Um, I was in Louisville. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was in Louisville getting trained in something called brain spotting, um, which is a kind of a cousin to EMDR. And I'm not going to get into it because it's not relevant to the discussion. But where I'm going with this is that, you know, Trauma is, and I know you said like, oh, the onion is not like a literal um, metaphor, and it's not, but actually the way that our brains are structured, um, there are different levels on which trauma is stored and processed in the brain. And this is something we were going over in the training where, you know, our prefrontal cortex is kind of what separates us from primates and <laughs> pretty much every other animal on the planet. You know, this is where all of our reasoning and, and rational thinking and being able to talk about our feelings and all of this stuff, that's kind of all in there. And that's great, but just talking about what you've been through is only one layer of the onion. You know, if we go back into the limbic system, and kind of the subcortical regions of the brain, we've got really the strong emotional components of trauma and the strong like physical components of trauma. So if those things aren't also dealt with in therapy, you're only peeling so many layers of the onion. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna, I was also curious about um, people, as how you would be able to differentiate or, or how you would assess, I guess, uh, somebody who's in denial about tra past traumatic experiences versus somebody who's healthily dealing with them and like, hey, no, I'm, I, you know, yeah, it really sucked and it was bad and I'm, I'm cool with it now. Mm -hmm. How do you tell, how do you tell which is which? That's a good question. Um, now that I'm in private practice, you know, people rarely come to see a therapist in private practice unless they are in a space of being like, I am not okay. I think it's because of what happened to me. <laughs> like I need to talk to somebody about it. Right. But I've definitely run into people when I've worked in treatment facilities who, you know, they were saying everything was okay, but their family or their loved ones were saying, uh, you know, like, no, we're, we're seeing some pretty big change in, in you. And we think it's because of what you've been through. Um, I would say that the differentiating factor between those two is both what the client says, like, you know, no, I'm, I'm legitimately okay, like everything's fine, but also asking them, or if you have access to their loved ones, asking them, like, you know, what do the people around you say? You know, are, are they feeling like you're, you're good and like not, not, no big changes, no big shifts? Or because, you know, occasionally you'll get somebody who's like, well, I think everything's OK, but boy, my wife is really saying that I'm different. And and it's like that kind of gives us an inroad to be like, well, let's talk about that and see if there's some merit to that. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. You know, it's my it's my experience because this I mean you know, again, working in treatment or having a private practice, I don't frequently come across people who are like genuinely okay. Cause like, why would they be there in the first place? You know? Um, but it has happened a few times over the years where it's like, they, they say they're okay. The people around them say they're okay. And it's like, yeah, you've been through this big thing, but if you've been able to move on from it in a healthy way, unless you feel like there's something you want to work on around it, I know, you know, again, I'm not in the business of telling people or trying to convince them that they have a problem that they don't think they have, you know? 
Um, so I think the key is usually not just checking in with them around them saying they're okay, but again, getting the feedback either directly from their loved ones or asking them what their loved ones say, because sometimes that can give you more indication of like, well, you might not think you think everything's okay, but your loved ones are noticing something else. Let's explore that, you know? Right, right. Yeah. I'm also wondering how much of a factor during your practice or what you've observed again with others, how much of a factor is education? Uh, and, and let's talk about cult recovery specifically, mm -hmm. um, because the cult paradigm is a very specific thing. It is not yeah. self-evident or obvious, especially to former members. Mm -hmm. uh, objectively, you know, people who are not never involved in it can look yeah. in on these groups and see things that members will never see. Yeah. And former members might take a while to get around to being able to see it because they're just so yeah. used to not seeing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, for me, I, I you know, I'm not going to project on everybody else. I, I've always recommended that people get educated on all of mm -hmm. these things because it definitely helped me. Yeah. Um, and I know it's helped others. I've said this to people. They've said, yes, that's absolutely true. But mm -hmm. from a therapy aspect, um, mm -hmm. what do you, what's, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think education is really important um, because I think generally, and again, this I, I see this becoming more and more of a thing, and I'm glad of it, that people are able to generally recognize that when they have been sexually abused, physically abused, or like egregiously like verbally abused, they're usually able to look at that and go, okay, something went wrong there, you know? Um, that was wrong. That I, they don't need to be told that most of the time. Sometimes they do, but most of the time, um, although it's interesting, some people still hesitate to use the word trauma for certain things when, you know, one of the things that I, I tell people all the time is like, your trauma counts. Like, the, like oh, uh, it was bad, but I don't know if it counts as trauma. It totally counts as trauma. <laughs> right, because they're but, comparing themselves to POWs coming back from Afghanistan yeah. or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like people who maybe they're, you know, they were fortunate enough, you know, no sexual abuse, no physical abuse, no being screamed at and called names or whatever, something very obvious, but they have been a, a, a part of an organization like this. And maybe they, they come see somebody like me because they feel like something's off, but they're not really quite sure what, or they just want to talk to somebody about what they've been through. Um, you know, educating them around, the, you know, um, manipulation and thought reform and how that really constitutes psychological abuse um, is useful because typically I find people who come to me in that state, they feel like something's wrong, but they're not quite sure what. And it can really help them to start break down and like you said, educate them on, okay, here's how these kinds of groups work in terms of coercion and manipulation it really helps people start to look at stuff and peel those layers of the onion back and they go, oh, this is why, even though I haven't been in this group for years, maybe, I'm still not feeling like I'm totally normal, you know, because I actually have been through something bad, even if it wasn't something that, you know, in, in larger culture, people would point out and go, oh, that's trauma, you know? Yeah, I think it, it speaks to what we were mentioning at the beginning about the, you know, the relativity of trauma from one person to another mm -hmm. to another and how that's that doesn't seem to be generally understood out there right it's always one of the points i want to i want to hit because i want people to get that you know yeah like you've said it's your trauma <laughs> yes yes <laughs> and it's you know it's okay it's, it's like you know it's, if you're yeah. not yeah. anybody else you are you you know yeah and honestly sometimes it's about education you know like like you were asking but sometimes it's really just about a perspective shift um, and that's, it's funny. I, I'm sorry. I meant to go and, and rewatch this before you and I talked. So I, and I didn't have time, so I'm going to have to paraphrase it. Um, but I was watching a video on, and I always get his last name mixed up, Aaron Smith Levin or Levin yes. Smith. Aaron Smith Levin. It, Smith Levin. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and one of his latest videos was the one about Serge. Yes. Um, Serge Gill. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to be paraphrasing it because I, I didn't, I wasn't able to go back and, and write it down, but I was watching his video and he, he said something that was, was quite simple, but struck me as, as profound where he was saying that Serge had helped him 
you know, he was so used to looking at things he had been through in Scientology through a certain lens that he kind of wasn't even aware that he was using that lens. And through talking to Serge, Serge kind of helped him go, okay, but what if we look at it through this lens? And that kind of made him go like, oh, wait a second. Like, wow, I'm looking at this whole thing differently. And when he said that, I was like, you just described therapy, dude. Like, <laughs> that, that was a great, you know, basic explanation of a lot of what I do. Some of it is education, but some of it is also just like, okay, so you're used to looking at what happened to you through this lens. Why don't we just shift and maybe look at it through this lens? How does that feel? You know, and honestly, that too, in addition to education, can in, in in conjunction with education, can be enough to really shift things for some people. Absolutely, I have yeah. certainly experienced that many times myself, mm -hmm. and uh, through the process of education, actually, because that's what forces you to see something from a whole different yeah. point of view. But also, you know, mm -hmm. exactly like you just laid out, yeah. through conversation, through yeah. you know, through watching others communicate about the subject new mm -hmm. perspectives are communicated that it was impossible yeah. for you to be able to think from or see or right. frame it that way because mm -hmm. it never ever ever would have occurred to you yeah. in your own experiential past mm -hmm. to look at it that way and yeah. that is that uh, surge has actually done the same service for me oh, good. <laughs> in, a, in a way actually just listening to him when we were on set right when we were mm -hmm. doing the show is mm -hmm. actually where that changed for me right Be yeah, yeah because i had had um remnants of the um you know still even mm -hmm. to, even to you know to relatively now right these remnants mm -hmm. of, of 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 what responsibility means yeah. and uh, what a victim is and mm -hmm. uh, and children right yeah. children in scientology having grown up in scientology myself and mm -hmm. you know not wanting to look at myself as some kind of like you know ha having had some you know alien upbringing yeah mm -hmm. you know you don't want that right i mean i went to yeah. public school yeah. <laughs> yeah you know it's but it's not the same it's not it's mm -hmm. not the same at all and the yeah. concepts that are communicated when you're a kid are very very different concepts than what are communicated to other children <laughs> yeah yeah uh which is not to say that scientology is the worst possible upbringing there are yeah. others that are even yeah. Worse. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, but it's just, mm -hmm. but it is different. And if, yeah. and if, and I wasn't appreciating some of those differences, I've talked yeah. at length about, you know, a few of those differences, mm -hmm. but then there were some others that I was still blind to. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's interesting because, and, and you can probably relate to this in terms of the, the critical thinking stuff that, that, you know, you've, you've, you do so well is, you know, part of, therapy for some people, well, for a lot of people, is even recognizing that they're using a lens. You know, right. some people right. are so used to how they're used to looking at things that they don't realize that it's just something they're looking through and that they can bring in a different lens and look through that. Like some people are, it's like the lens has become fused with their eyeball, <laughs> you know, and they're not even aware that they're using a lens you know so even just helping people with that and being like oh i'm actually using a paradigm that i'm thinking through and i can actually use other paradigms you know um so that th even that process alone can be really huge for some people to get to that place and be like oh wait i've, I've really just fused with this thing that's not even a part of me it's just something i was taught and, and I, I didn't even realize I had other options. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think this also feeds into why we stress um, to get rid of the language, mm -hmm. the, the specialized cult language, because it, yeah. you know, I've always explained it kind of in a, well, it gets you out of the, the bad thought patterns or, mm -hmm. or, uh, or, you know, and then, and then more recently, oh yeah, literally retrains your brain, literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. having to concentratedly yeah. think over and over again about other terms to use mm -hmm. for those specialized terms. You know, you come up with regular English translations. Mm -hmm. And after doing that, if you're kind of forcing yourself to do it for a while, it's really no different than yeah. any other acquired skill. And yeah. you lose, you don't, you don't forget the old terminology, you just stop mm -hmm. thinking that way. Yeah. And that itself, I think, it, you know, mm -hmm. certainly for me has been very cathartic. Do you, that's is that right. a general thing that's practiced? 
Um, it is. I mean, luckily, I hmm, the clients that I have worked with by and large, by the time they get to me, they're in a place where they're not using the jargon uh, so much in their everyday life. Sometimes they will use it with me um, to, to, you know, when they're telling me stories about what happened in the past. Um, and it's certainly not, not something that I'm like, you know, oh, try to use different words because it's just, you know, the situation was what it was in the past. Um, but I, if I was to start working with somebody who was still very locked into using some of that language, I would absolutely um, explore that as an intervention with them of like, you know, what if, what if you tried a day where you weren't, or an hour where you weren't using these words? Like, what would that be like? What could that be like? Um, because yeah, I think it does serve to separate you from other people and it serves to keep you stuck in that lens uh, of, of looking at things. Exactly. I think it's, I think it's all about the framing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I think that's a really, really great point. Mm -hmm. And the language is, is obviously contributory to that. Definitely. What other factors do you run across that, you know, that, that I might not be thinking of that, and I'm sure there, there must be, <laughs> must be plenty, <laughs> um, that you find you, you know, maybe even sometimes are surprised you have to deal with, mm -hmm. with people who are coming out of high control groups. Hmm. Well, I'm not I guess surprised by anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, <laughs> I like to tell my clients like there. You know, I've I've heard and seen a lot. Like, <laughs> there's very little you could do or say where I would be like, what? You know. Um, that being said, of course, there are still things I'm sure out there that I that I haven't run into yet. But you know, one thing that I guess I I hadn't really anticipated running into as much as I have is people who contact me and are consider themselves to be out of the group, but still have friends and or family that are in, that they are trying to walk a very fine line with in terms of like, they don't want to be very public or, you know, come out of the closet, so to speak, as like, I'm not a part of this group anymore. Um, but in within themselves, they know that they're definitely not, they're done with it. Um, but they're trying to finesse these family or friend relationships um, and try to navigate those while not being too obviously out of the group. That is that is a tricky situation that I run into more often than not. Um, and it definitely happens uh, in any group that has a, a disconnection policy like Scientology does because, and Scientology is certainly not the only one that does, um, but where, you know, they know that if they cross a certain line, they're going to lose that relationship. Um, and that's a really tricky dance for people to do. I've, I've seen my clients really struggle with it because they really value this relationship but at times they feel like they're not authentically being themselves in that relationship because they're pretending to not be done with this group, you know? Um, so that's a really tough situation to, to work through with some people because it brings up so, so many different things. Um, in terms of other... I, I just want to comment real fast on that mm -hmm. only because I'm surprised and then I'm surprised that I'm surprised <laughs> that there would be people who, you know, the, the kind of person you just described is somebody mm -hmm. we call under the radar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? UTRs, right? Yeah. <laughs> we have our mm -hmm. own little abbreviation. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's just, you know, and, and other groups even have, have adopted that or have, mm -hmm. have, have their own terms yeah. for it. I forgot what the JW term is for that, mm -hmm. but there's, there's a term for it yeah. that they use. And I, um, but I was surprised to think, oh, some of them could have gone to therapy, like that they would go that far out mm -hmm. and still try to maintain connections. They with do. Them. <laughs> Dare I ask, or can mm -hmm. you answer, have you mm -hmm. ever had Scientology UTRs? Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's, yeah. that's just something I hadn't thought of, is that they would be okay. that far out and yeah. still be maintaining connections with family and friends. Because they would have to, I suppose, have even have to keep the fact that they're going to therapy under wraps. Oh, totally. Yeah. No. Oh, that, that's, that was, yes. That must be yeah. very, very difficult. I, yeah. I've been lucky, I guess, because I didn't have to suffer familial disconnection that I mm -hmm. um, uh, didn't, you know, that I didn't have a, a long period of that 
Mm-hmm. Let's play the mouse game. It was it only it went on for about a year before I got declared. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, probably about six months, I guess. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's a tricky, sucky place to be. And I I yeah. I I was I never looked back after I came out and said, okay, mm-hmm. I'm out, I'm done. Here's my name. Yeah. I'm on video. Boom. Yeah. It's never been a regret of mine yeah. that I did that, mm-hmm. even with all the people that I lost. Yeah, and you know, I, I guess. The, the folks, the, the under the radar folks that I've worked with who um, they've been lucky in a way because they've had their people in the group, but they've also had people outside of the group who they were friends with, who they could talk to openly about this stuff and say that they were going to therapy and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredibly, it's incredibly difficult. Like I, I work with a lot of um, LGBTQ clients in my practice too. And I've worked with a few clients who've been in the closet you know, to, to certain people. And it's, it's definitely got its parallels in terms of like, you know, having this whole part of your authentic self that you're not able to be a hundred percent out there with. Um, and that, that really wears on people over time, you know? I'll bet. You know, uh, down. Yeah. I mean, it must be, it, 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 well, obviously it just, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so now in terms of, uh, I was wondering, what kind of things would you recommend to people, either consider it as pre-therapy or Mm -hmm. as, you know, things they can just do, Mm -hmm. you know, on their own, right, that are substantial, Mm -hmm. that actually would make a difference. It's not just, you know, nice, uh, you know, mantras, but... (laughs) Things people can really do that either, again, coming out of a narcissistic relationship, coming out of a religion, coming out of a cult, yeah. whatever the situation is, mm-hmm. what kind of things are available to people out there? Sure. So this is something that I get um, quite a bit. And I actually got uh, a couple people contacting me. I mean, I got several people contacting me after the aftermath finale, but a few of them were of this nature where it's like, you know, either I can't afford therapy or there's no options where I live or, you know, I'm under the radar and I can't just go do whatever I want whenever I want or spend money however I want. Um, So typically for people in those situations, um, I have a couple different uh, recommendations that I make. You know, one of them is to uh, contact the International Cultic Studies Association um, because they... Um, often, you know, uh, if you can't afford therapy, I totally get that, but they often have both in-person and online, um, groups or events for recovering members that are usually very inexpensive. Um, so those, when they're happening are a good resource to use. Also, I find that people don't seem to, um, really know, and this is probably just a whole part of the larger education problem around like emotional and psychological skills. People don't seem to know that like there are low cost therapy options out there. Um, I'm oftentimes like linking people up with, you know, folks I find online who are work on a sliding scale or there's like a, like a school people, people might not know that. I guess I'll share it now because people might not know this, but most um, schools will pe- where people get their master's or their doctorate in therapy um, will run like a community counseling clinic where people can work as like a, a trainee or an assistant while they're getting licensed and uh, they're being supervised by somebody who does have a license. And oftentimes those places can see people for like 20 bucks a session, you know? Um, so I like to, to find out if I can find one in the person's area and shoot that info their way. But if for whatever reason, like actually going to see someone isn't a realistic option, um, I got to say, I'm a big fan of workbooks. Um, there really aren't, th- this may have changed. I haven't looked in a couple of years. As far as I know, there's only one workbook out there that is specifically for former cult members and it's specifically for former Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you, you should look that book up. <laughs> but, um, unfortunately, there aren't any other workbooks out there that are like specific for former cult members. However, two things that when you gave me the the topic we were going to talk about today that I was kind of turning around like, oh, those could be good options. Two things are cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT and acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. 
Um, and there, I mean, if you go to Amazon <laughs> and you put in their CBT workbook or ACT workbook, you are going to get a lot of responses back. Um, because CBT and ACT are nice because while I would recommend, you know, if you can have the time and the money to see a therapist like myself, who's trained in CBT or ACT, that would be the, the best line of defense. But if that's not an option, it's not that hard to learn CBT and ACT skills from a workbook. Um, and these are really good and I'll, I'll speak more to CBT, but, um, CBT is really good because it really helps untwist some of the irrational biased thinking you get taught and indoctrinated in, in cults. Um, cause CBT is all about, um, recognizing when your thoughts are irrational, learning how to kind of investigate them and get evidence for them and against them, and then learning how to like untwist them and base them more on the rational information that you have. Um, so that, I mean, and there, there are literally a kajillion CBT workbooks out there for people. Um, I'm a fan of the, the publisher New Harbinger because they make really good workbooks, but honestly, pretty much any CBT workbook is probably fine. Um, but if you want to start to get the skills in learning how to think differently and learning how to act in ways that maybe weren't okay with the group you were in, but you want to do, those would be my suggestions would be CBT and act. Excellent. Yeah. yeah I have done a little bit of those, the CBT through workbooks mm -hmm. uh, yeah. here at home and uh, yeah. definitely useful. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, yeah. I'm biased. I'm trained in CBT. Yeah, but yeah. of course. <laughs> I would agree. No, yeah. I, I heard about it, and um, mm -hmm. and and it's exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Now, I want to ask about something a little bit different here. You know, how long have you been doing this? I have been working in the field of psychology for over 15 years now. Okay. So, yeah. and and as a as a um, Clinical psychologist, somebody seeing somebody? Yes. So, you know, when um, I got my bachelor's in psychology and then pretty much the only job you can do in the field when you just have a bachelor's is what I did while, while I was getting my master's, which is I worked uh, at home and at school as a one-on-one -on -one behavior therapist with uh, children in the autism spectrum. So technically my like... It, it, face-to-face -face work with clients started then. Um, and then once I got my master's, that was when I was actually able to start doing like therapy in an office with adults, you know. Got yeah. it, okay. I, the reason I asked about time length is just to give people a spectrum here. Mm -hmm. In all that time that you have been doing this, <laughs> have you, what have you observed in terms of one awareness mm -hmm. of trauma? Mm -hmm you know, and high control groups mm -hmm. um, and the relationship between the two. Yeah. Uh, and how has that, how, how has general awareness of it affected people who come to see you for therapy? Mm. Yeah. So I have definitely noticed over the 15 years I've been doing this an increased awareness and acceptance around trauma. Um, like I said, we still have a ways to go. I still deal with people who come into my office and say that something really terrible happened to them. And then they go, but I know that doesn't really count as trauma. It's like, no, I, I have news for you. It does. <laughs> um, right. but that has become a less and less frequent occurrence over the years. Um, and so I'm obviously, again, as a trauma specialist, I am, I am glad for that. Um, because it makes people's problems less mysterious to them when they can be like, oh, that thing really was that bad. And that's probably why I'm having trouble now. Mm. Um, so I've definitely seen that. And I have seen uh, client and public awareness around cults and high control groups increase over time, not nearly to the degree that information about trauma has increased. Um, but, you know, thankfully to, to, to shows like Leah Remini and Mike Rinder's show, you know, on a big cable channel like A and E, you know that that gets public awareness, and there's been a lot of podcasts on it too. Um, the the coverage of the Nexium stuff, um, you know, that's definitely gotten people's uh, awareness up around it. In terms of when clients come to me, yes, I'm getting more and more clients who are more assured, like 
I've been trying, you know, I've, I've been through trauma. I need help. Um, and I'd say, I mean, yeah, I guess that the clients that I've seen who have, have identified as being former cult members have, have come along with more assurance around like, yeah, no, I know that what happened to me wasn't okay. And that this group was, maybe they might not use the word cult, but like, this was a really abusive group. And I, I think I need some help. Um, so yes, I have seen that and I, I am appreciative of it. I, I hope it continues. Awesome. What can people expect? What should mm-hmm. their expectations be mm-hmm. in coming to therapy? Oh, that's a great question. I like that. Because <laughs> again, I don't think we, we get any education around this, uh, certainly not in school and typically not from our families. So um, expectations for therapy. So first of all, don't expect that the first therapist that you like pick out of the, I almost said phone book. Who uses phone books anymore? Um, the first therapist that you find in the psychology today directory um, and you go to see is going to be a great match for you. Um, I am an advocate of therapist shopping. Um, you know, even the most amazing therapist will not be a great match for every client that walks through their door. So if you go to see somebody and it just doesn't feel like quite a good fit, there's nothing wrong with you. It's cool. Try seeing a few different people. And luckily, most of the people I know in private practice offer free consults. Um, Sometimes they're in the office. More often, there may be video or phone. Um, But that gives you the chance to kind of see if it's a good vibe between the two of the you before you plunk down money to go see them. Um, so expect to maybe look around a little, you know, and, and that's okay. That is, that is normal to, to meet with a few different people and be like, I didn't really feel it with those two, but I really like that one guy, you know? Um, also let's see other expectations about therapy. Um, you know, one thing that I, I like to assure uh, recovering cult members that I see is I, I really like to double down on the HIPAA and the confidentiality stuff because oftentimes they are quite scared that somehow I'm going to be able to tell people that they're in therapy or their information is going to get out there. So I really like to double down on that and be like, no. And, and if that happened, I could lose my license. Like, unless you give me explicit written permission to disclose to someone that I am seeing you for therapy, I can't even say that I know you, you know? Um, So that can be helpful for some folks. Other expectations? um, Also, don't expect every therapist to have the same style, you know? Some of us are more, you know, proactive and like giving you tools and asking you questions. Other people are kind of more of the the stereotype of the old... um, the old, you know, psychoanalyst who just kind of sits there and listens to you and then says, tell me about your mother, you know, um, everybody's got their own style and their own trainings that they've done. So again, it's important to find somebody that has a style and an orientation that fits you. Um, also I should mention this, uh, uh, and this will be the last one in regard to, to being a trauma survivor, um, is, it's okay. Well, let me think of how to phrase this. Any trauma therapist who is experienced at what they do is not going to make you tell your whole story right off the bat. A lot of people get real scared, whether it's cult related or not, that if they're going to go to therapy, their therapist is going to rip this open and they're going to have to like spill their guts and have all this painful stuff come out. Any decent trauma therapist is going to help you process your trauma in a very slow, titrated fashion. Um, And I've even had sessions, I was just talking to a client about this the other day, I've even had sessions where I've had to slow people down and say like, whoa, whoa, I definitely want to hear all this, but I'm afraid that if you start going into this amount of detail in our first or second session, I'm never going to see you again because you're going to spill it all, leave the office, freak out and ghost me. (laughs) You know, like I I've actually had to slow people down before, you know? And so it's good to expect that you're not going to have to bear your soul and all the things you might be ashamed of from the get go. We know that that is not a good idea. 
and that we are going to do it with you in a much slower, um, less overwhelming fashion. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, good. Thank you for, for all of that. Um, you know, these were great. These are, this is really good. We're going to move to wrapping up now, but I wanted to, to just say all of this makes complete sense to me. I'm really glad we had this discussion and it makes complete sense to me why they called you when it was like, okay, who are we going to get in here? And, uh, be, uh, you know, therapist component. Mm -hmm. well, I got an idea. <laughs> well, and I got to tell you, I got to tell you though, real quick, the way that they found me was that one of the production assistants found my website, found the cult thing, and then saw that I had been on your show. No kidding. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, because he was like, oh, good. She knows about cults and stuff. But then, like, I have it listed on my website that I was on your show. And he was like, oh, she actually knows about Scientology. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Well, I have never been a credential for somebody before, so that's kind of awesome. <laughs> but you, you know, you were really great in the show. And I really, I really should have said that at the beginning up front because I was, I, your answers were wonderful. So I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, it was a really good experience. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So, um, so Natalie, thank you very much. You are welcome. Uh, <laughs> okay, guys, any questions, comments, feedback, leave it in the comment section below here on YouTube or at sensiblyspeaking.com. And maybe uh, Natalie will bother to stop by and look at some of them uh, over the weekend or something. And, and uh, sure. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, see you next week. Bye bye. <laughs>